And we have a three speaker, which I will introduce in a moment. But before we do that, we always ask the very first thing, who is hiring? In the back, come up here and shout. Thank you. 
single slideshow we have is up there now. And it's all sortable and searchable by topic and presenter and location. And also the videos, we are live streaming now, and all the live streams that we've ever had are available up there. So you can search for those live streams at nyhackhour.org. I highly recommend everyone check that out. It's a really great resource now. Our next meetup is April 16th. It's featuring Andy Dow. He's the one who wrote the Random Forest Package in R. So sign up soon. We're going to make that announcement tomorrow. Sign up fast because that will sell out. In the coming months, we have a master class workshop. These are going to be like two to three day workshops taught by the field how to do something in a very technical way. We have Max Kuhn talking about the carrot package. We have Rob Hinman talking about the forecast package. And we have Jonah Gabbery and some other members of the STAN team talking about STAN. So that's going to be a nice couple of workshops. More information will be sent out later. With that, we have two giveaways. The first giveaway is an autographed copy of the Keyboard Guitar. Who came to the meetup last month? So all of you had your chance today. You have another chance today to win this. The winner goes to, and you have to be present, Christoph Eschelman. Never get on the first try. <laughs> I speak Christoph. <laughs> You already have a damn mafia shirt. Uh, Jamie Lee. Jamie? No one wants the ball. No one wants deep floating over height, right? That's why. <laughs> Brian Harbo. There you go. So we're going to. I'll pass it down the crib. I'll try someone to make it. If it doesn't make it all the way down, we'll find out who, who stole it. <laughs> And lastly, um, we're going to give away. Is this? Yeah. Yeah, we totally lost battery. Uh, all right. I'll yeah. shout. Try this one. Uh, cool. Thank you. And the last giveaway, we're going to give away a free pass in New York Art Conference. So I really hope whoever wins this is not, not already a ticket. <laughs> Kevin Hill. Oh. <laughs> all right. Stephanie Wiggleby. Hey! Alright, I will contact you. I will you and give you your card and that we will be in touch and we'll get a free gift in the York Conference. Alright, with that, I just want to remind you we're going to go to the pizza bar and we have our amazing speaker. And the thing I want to say about this amazing speaker is that, alright, we might get a battery for all of them. Third? Loudly. Try that until we get you a working mic, and we'll do our yeah, best. Yeah, I'm. Much. I'm. Oh, I have geez. a loud voice. Okay. Okay. We'll see. This is just one more thing to manage, so something's going to give uh, somewhere. But um, anyway, uh, thank you so much, Jared, for the very kind introduction, and um, and for inviting me. And this is such a great crowd. I'm really excited for this. So um, I have to start with you know, given I'm a statistician, with some surveying. So, oh yeah, it's gone. Right. Okay. Uh, Try so this one again, and then. No, no. Breaking things. We all never going to invite me back. So. Okay. We'll try. Uh, so, the categories I'm going to list are not mutually exclusive. So you can vote for more than one. Who here considers themselves to be a statistician? Who here considers themselves to be a machine learner? Computer scientists more broadly? 
uh, data scientist. Interesting. Um, what else? Quantitative social scientist. Uh, quantitative other kind of scientist. <laughs> Something I haven't named. This one's more charged, I heard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's helpful. All right, um, and interesting. Okay, so I should, I should say that this is joint work with lots and lots of people. I think we're done. I think we're just done with the mics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, joint with lots of people, uh, as, as most everyone's work, right? So uh, I will call out Nicole Carnegie, Dan Cervone, Masa Harada, uh, Mark Scott, Uri Shalit, Yusung Su, but mostly I want to call out Vince Dory, who's hiding right there, but he's going to stand up and wave quickly. Uh, without him, I think none of the most, a lot of this would not have happened. We don't have the counterfactual world, but uh, that is my supposition, and I don't want to run that experiment. So, uh, and I should thank IES for um, being a generous funder. Okay, so uh, Andrew and I used to debate, but I think I've maybe won him over, that uh, m most interesting questions in the world are causal questions. They're just, most research questions are causal questions, even if people are pretending that they are not. What people really want to answer are the causal questions, right? And you think about the questions you, that run through your mind all day. Uh, they're causal questions. Take note tomorrow as you run through your day and the things you think about. Like, we're always asking why questions from the time we're two years old, right, through the rest of our lives. We want to know why. Um, so what drive, the, I just pulled these from New York Times headlines. What drives success? Can we alter genes? Is obesity contagious? Some are ridiculous, some are less ridiculous. Um, some are relevant to our lives, some are less, but um, someone thinks at least some of these are important, right? Um, so it's important because we care about these questions, we care about answering these questions. It's important for us as, let's say, broadly speaking, data scientists, um, because if we get the wrong answer, the consequences could be bad, right? Um, and unfortunately, there's a long history of us getting the wrong answer. Why do we get it wrong so often? So I'm going to run quickly through just a few examples of kind of cautionary tales. Um, so the Salk vaccine, probably everyone's heard, many of you have heard some version of this story. Um, polio epidemic, what are we going to do? Salk creates the first vaccine ever. Uh, but they do some observational studies. It looks like it's not working. Oh, well, I guess we're screwed. But luckily, some smart people ran a randomized experiment. The randomized experiment showed that it was effective. People adopt the Salk vaccine. Polio gets eradicated. It's a big success story, right? And then other vaccines come along down the, the, the pike. Lots of lives saved because of that one. Flash forward, so you think we would learn our lesson, like we can't always do randomized experiments, but we'd like to, you know, let's at least hold that up as the gold standard. Um, big data hits and people just start saying wacky things, <laughs> right? So I feel badly for calling this out. I don't know if this person has changed their mind since, but it was just too delicious to not to not put up there, right? So there's now a better way. Petabytes allow us to say correlation is enough. We can stop looking for models. We can analyze the data without hypotheses about what it might show. All right, just crazy talk, right? We, we don't wanna, so uh, what's an example of why that doesn't work? So this is, you know, for the business world, actually, and the, and the, the great solution here came out of eBay Totally coincidentally, I did not look for this example because I knew I was going to be here. Um, so lots and lots and lots of money spent on internet advertising. Still every year in 2011, it was 31.7 billion. And the common wisdom based on naive data science was that it was highly effective, right? Let's place ads and then people will click on those things and then they'll want to buy those things. And they thought, this is great, we have all this data. Right, because we can look at who's clicking on the things and then we can look and see if they buy. So if they click on it and then they buy it, it must be 
because they clicked on it. Or, or a thousand other reasons, right? That they could have done that, right? So people are wasting all this money on internet advertising. eBay runs, at that point it was a quasi-experiment, um, just doing a kind of simple comparison group design and sees that actually 99% of the click traffic was simply redirected through natural search traffic. In other words, people were going to find those thi the things they want to find anyway, right? Which is why I have to really bite my tongue when the people I work with are trying to tell me about where we should place ads for our master's program, right? Because they know, they've seen all the clicks, and I'm like, I know that, but. So um, anyway, this, and so this, this kind of changed that world a bit. Uh, hormone replacement therapy, this is an interesting one because it's more nuanced. And of course, they're all nuanced, and I'm glossing over all the nuance. Um, but maybe some of you remember this big kerfuffle in the news about 10 years ago, the Nurses Health Study, which was a long, longitudinal study that's been going on forever with a big cohort of nurses. Um, there was evidence coming out of that that hormone replacement therapy was good for coronary heart disease. Yay, it's great for menopausal women to go on hormone replacement therapy. The Women's Health Initiative comes along, does a randomized trial, and oh, people are dying. So um, that was one of those where it was like, ah, the observational evidence was telling us the wrong thing. Interestingly, that one's more nuanced because we really were looking at different populations and different kinds of HRT that was administered at different points in people's lives. Miguel Hernan gives a fantastic talk on this. They've got me and Jamie Robbins have some great papers on it. And it turns out if you're really thoughtful and think about it causally and use thoughtful models, you can actually reconcile the two. So that really there's a lot of heterogeneity and they can, they've kind of figured out that story, which is super interesting. Okay, so the question is, if we can't do a randomized experiment, which for many of us is the world we're in a lot of the time, what can we do to feel a little better about the inferences we're getting? So who here has ever taken a class in causal inference? Okay. Um, who here has read a book on causal inference? Okay. Uh, who has been exposed to the potential outcomes framework? Uh, how about the like Perl directed acyclic graphs framework? Who here has never seen anything to do with causal inference? Okay, thanks. So we'll do a quick review. Uh, so think of a simple example. We want to know about the effect of an enrichment program on subsequent test scores for grade school kids. So whether or not, let's pretend that whether or not you get into the program is based on a pre-test score, but it's not a simple cutoff. It's probabilistic, right? So I don't know when that would happen, <laughs> right? But I'm simplifying it just to, to, to make pretty plots <laughs> that we can all see. So say that, so we've got a probabilistic mechanism. So here is the distribution of pretest scores for our treated. Here it is for the controls, right? So there's a difference between those two groups in terms of to, what, to the extent that pretest score measures some kind of native ability, right? Now let's further suppose that there is heterogeneity in the treatment effect. So what I'm showing here is pretest scores versus post-test scores. And I'm showing the solid lines show the true relationship between those things. For the blue represents what happens if you do not get exposed to the enrichment program. The red shows what that relationship looks like if you do get exposed to the program, right? Like my entire first five weeks of my causal inference course could be summarized in this one plot, right? So what can we learn from this plot? Well, for instance, someone with a pretest score of 30, their causal effect would be expected to be the difference between these two lines, right? What would happen to you if you got the treatment minus what would happen to you if you didn't get the treatment? So that's a lot of what causal inference is about, right? It's what would happen to you here versus what would happen to you there. And this is a graphical way of just showing that, hey, actually, in this case, it matters a lot, you know, what you started out with. So that we've got heterogeneous treatment effects, um, and we've got response surfaces that are not necessarily easy to capture with a linear model. Now, 
I've got fake data here, right? So if I actually plotted this, I could fit a non-parametric model that would fit it and we'd all be fine. But the fact of the matter is that most of the time when we're in this world, we've got 30, 50, 100, 200 covariates. That's not so easy to do, right, to fit those models. Um, what else is going wrong here? Well, we don't have overlap between the two groups, right? So since we have those differences, since the People who didn't, so the, sorry, the dots are the, the actual observations in our fake world. Um, for the, the control people who don't get exposed to the enrichment program, the ones who are down here, then the treated people are all over here. So if we want to think about, well, what's the effect, or what would the effect be for someone who didn't get the program and had a low pretest -score, pre score to begin with? Well, I would have to imagine what would have happened to them had they gotten the treatment. But I don't have any data that tells me anything about that, right? Yet, people fit models all the time that don't look at whether or not we have overlap, right? And same thing over here. If I want to think about what would have happened to these people if they hadn't gotten the treatment, well, I've got precious little data down here to tell me what to do, okay? So this is the, like, the entire literature for the past, I don't know, 30 years on propensity score matching and all that stuff, that, that's, that's all that it's about. That's what it's solving, is that problem, that this is hard to model. <laughs> um, and the fact of the matter is, in 87, that was hard to model. In 83, sorry, is the first propensity score paper. It's not that bad anymore, right? We actually can do this pretty well now. Um, and yet, until recently, people weren't using tools that let us fit these models well. So that's, that's major, mostly what this talk is about. Okay, yeah, and this is, we've only, we've only got one confounder here, right? It gets trickier once we get many, many confounders. All right, so just like, let's keep these ideas in our head. Causal inference with observational studies is hard for two reasons. One, I'm gonna formalize this in a second. We have to assume, we have to make this assumption that we've measured all the confounders. We've measured all those things that predict both whether or not we get the treatment and whether or not, or what, what our outcome looks like, okay? So that assumption is called different things in different fields. Uh, in statistics, we usually call it ignorability. Uh, all confounders measured is a little easier to stick in your mind, which is why I used it for this talk. Um, in econometrics, it's, uh, it's selection on observables, in epidemiology, it's usually all confounders measured or um, uh, exchangeability, which is confusing because there's exchangeability means different things in different places. Uh, anyway, every field has their own, their own terminology for this. No hidden bias is another one. Now, suppose we want to satisfy that assumption, right? We want to say we've measured everything that's important. So we've got a lot to measure. We measure a lot, we measure a lot, we measure a lot. We're controlling for 100, 200 variables, guess what that makes hard? The second assumption, <laughs> that we're modeling things correctly, right? So in order to control for all those things, we, you know, statisticians typically like to just throw them all in a model. We've conditioned on all these variables. So you can imagine throwing them all in a linear regression, right? Well, we know not to do that. Why don't we do that again? Why is, oh, because that's correlation, not causation? It's because we don't believe the model. That's all that's going on there, right? So propensity score matching versus linear regression, all, all, we're getting all we're buying there is a weakening of parametric assumptions. That's the only magic going on. It's not really that magical. Okay. So I don't even know why I did notation. I've only got three slides with notation. Um, X is gonna be covariates. Z is a binary treatment variable. Potential outcomes not everyone has seen, so I'll just do a quick review, potential outcomes are a way of um, formalizing counterfactuals. So that whole idea of, with our example, we want to know what would happen to you if you did get the enrichment, enrichment program, that's your Y1. And we want to know what would happen to you if you didn't get the enrichment program, that's your Y0. So for each person, we want to be able to think about both of those things, and the fundamental problem of causal inference is we only get to see that for one or the other. We don't get to see both for you. 
right? So then we have to make all these other assumptions. So these, I measured all my confounders, all the parametric assumptions. That's all about trying to solve that problem. And then we measure all kinds of average things. We usually don't think we can estimate an individual level causal effect, but maybe we can get some averages. Maybe that works. Okay, so structural assumptions, the all confounders measured, and that's how it gets formalized, that your potential outcomes are independent of your treatment, conditional on everything you see. That's like saying if you saw two people and they looked exactly the same on everything you can measure, it's just like a coin flip, whether or not they got the treatment or not, okay? How they would have ended up with their Y0s and their Y1s, that's the same, so it's just, they maybe got the treatment, maybe didn't, it's like a little randomized experiment in there. Uh, that's another way of conceptualizing this. If you can think of randomized block experiments, it's like a big ass randomized block experiment, right? Um, with the, the difference being in a randomized block experiment, you know what the blocks are, right? In an observational study, you're pretending you know, right? I'm saying within the strata defined by all those things, people are just the same. I've just randomized within that. Okay, that's the hard one. And that's the one that there's very little attention to. And that's why we do randomized experiments. This is where most of the action is research-wise, the parametric assumptions, right? So since we don't usually have a randomized experiment, we do everything in our power to try to satisfy that first assumption. How do we do that? We measure as much as we can and we just say, let's control for it all. Okay, What's the, what are the problems with that? There are a couple of potential problems, but the biggest one usually is that then we have to fit a model to that. To control for all those things, we have to fit a model. Unless you do something like propensity score matching, which is, is meant to be a workaround to that. But guess what? Then you have to fit a model to estimate the propensity score, which comes with its own baggage. Okay. So I'll talk about parametric assumptions first, and then I'll give a nod to the structural assumptions. All right, so here's what, so <laughs> we're at what time? And I'm just hitting the roadmap, but you know, it's all gonna work out. There may be some quickly sifting through slides at the end. So I'm gonna talk about using um, BART, which I haven't even introduced yet, to fit the response surface. That is the um, expectation of the outcome conditional on my treatment and my covariates. Um, I'm gonna talk about using BART to, uh, and it's automatic uncertainty quantification to understand when we don't have common support or overlap across our groups. Talk a little bit about heterogeneity and treatment effects and generalizability to other populations. And then I'll introduce the R package BART cause, which is officially in beta testing right now. And I'll give you the website so you can help us test it. Uh, then we'll go on and talk a little about how, how can we weaken some of those structural assumptions so we don't have to make that crazy assumption that we don't really believe that we've measured everything. And then I'll talk a little about why, why BART. Of all the machine learning things, why BART? Does it have to be BART? Spoiler alert, no. But, okay. Uh, so BART is Bayesian Additive Regression Trees. Um, it was introduced by Chipman, George, and McCullough about 10 years ago. Um, and it just works really well in a lot of situations. So how does it work? Who knows about regression trees? Who knows about boosted regression trees? Okay, I can fly through this section. Uh, okay, so it's kind of like a Bayesian version of regression trees. And George gets mad when I say that because there's reasons why it's not, but I'll tell you the reasons why it's not. But Basically, it's. Um, okay. Regression trees, uh, quickly. If we want to look at the relationship, say in this case between one variable and another, I just have a y and an x, I want to model that. I could fit a line to it. In this case, the line's not really going to capture it all that well, right? Because this is a nonlinear relationship. So, what else might I do? Uh, well, a kind of a basic way of thinking about it is. I mean, regression is just a way of um, characterizing subgroup means, right? Students hate it when I say that, but really that's what it's doing. <laughs> subgroup means maybe they have a relationship, let's throw a line on that, right? What if we don't want to specify a relationship between those subgroup means? What if they're just are some subgroup means? 
Well, how would we choose the subgroups? Well, let's divide our data. Let's take one pass where we divide it. And in the two groups, we try to make sure that we are maximizing the heterogeneity within, OK? So we split that way. Then within those groups, we split again, we split again. You know, you could split to the point where each data point got its own mean. We don't really want to do that. That's too far. When do you stop? Oh. It just goes on and on forever. It's hard, right? So regression trees were a great idea, but it was like it got a little out of control. What are we going to do? How do we stop? So boosted regression trees. Um, yeah, refines interactions on linear areas are not the best for it, additive models. Boosted regression trees, super clever, says, all right, let's do this instead. Let's fit a little tiny tree to our data. So now we say we've got four terminal nodes four subgroups, each one has a mean. Subtract off that fit. Now I got a bunch of residuals. To those residuals, let's fit a little tiny tree. And just keep doing it. That's what a backfitting algorithm is, right? So we just keep doing that. So each time, what's left over is what hasn't been explained. And then we try to explain what hasn't been explained. So it's nice because it, it, it gets that multivariate kind of non-parametric piece with the trees, each individual tree. But it also allows you to get the additive structure. Okay? So it's an additive tree. This is different from random forests. Okay? Random forest is model averaging with trees. This is an additive model. Different, right? They, there's lots of similarities, but some differences. Um, now, what's the problem? You do 200 of those, you're going to overfit your data, right? So how do you deal with that? There's a tuning parameter. So the tuning parameter is just a little number that you multiply the fit all along, and then it shrinks it. And maybe that's good, maybe it's not. How do you choose cross-validation? Cross-validation, OK, then I choose my tuning parameter, OK, great. And then at the end of the day, I get some great predictions. How do I get my uncertainty? Bootstrapping, right? Oh, Jesus Christ, you know, who wants to do all that? It's a hassle. I don't want to do it. So ad hoc choose choice of tuning parameters or cross-validation. Then you bootstrap it. And really, if you're going to do the bootstrap right, you should be bootstrapping the cross-validation piece, too, which is hairy. Bleh. So Chip and George and McCullough, brilliant. Brilliant. They, they have the kind of a, Ed gives a great talk of kind of how they, they got there and the mistakes they made and the times they felt like they'd never solve it. And it's, it's good. Um, they solved it. <laughs> so what they do, they threw it all. Like this is, the, this is the synergy thing you always wish for. The statistics and the machine learning coming together. Let's take the best of both, make the Reese's peanut butter cup, right? So they threw it within a likelihood framework, right? And they thought, how can we be Bayesian about this, right? We can't fit this in the usual kind of ways. This is going to be really hard to do. So some of you may have seen the asymptotics that have been done recently with regard to random force. That's great, but it's really hard. And because it's really hard, you can only do it for circumstances that really may have nothing to do with what your data and your situation actually looks like they ask by the time you get to those asymptotics. I'm not always Bayesian, right? I'm a practical Bayesian. I'm a pragmatic Bayesian, not a Crazian, but <laughs> This, it, it's one of those examples where it just makes it so much easier. I'm all about, like, I'm lazy, right? Like, what's going to make it easier for me? This makes it so much easier. So they just came up with super clever priors. Uh, I don't have time to go into the priors. I've got papers. They've got papers. Um, it's in there. You know, they write well. It's all, it's all um, easy, pretty easy to understand. But basically, the priors lean towards small trees. And that, that kind of thing that you would multiply everything by, that's just a typical shrinkage kind of thing that we do all the time in Bayesian statistics. So that was very natural. And they center their data so that everything is basically based on what your data looked like to begin with. So you can almost think of it as um, an empirical Bayesian kind of approach. Uh, so because of that, it works really well. So they've got some nice papers where you compare it to kind of the, the things that were at least standard in the field when they were publishing 10 years ago. And it works as good as the others when the others use cross-validation to choose their tuning parameters, and they just use their default prior, right? And if you use cross-validation to choose the tuning parameters here, it does even better. So 
it just has nice properties. Okay. So, hey, I stole from them. Again, I'm lazy. Um, lots of different ways of, of, no, several different ways if you want to apply BART to your data. Uh, Bayes Tree was the main package that's out there. There's now a better alternative. So Vince wrote a package that is faster, better. It's got all these great things that I don't really completely understand because he wrote it. C++ with efficient data structures, natively parallelized within and across chains, um, parallel cross-validation. It's got features that, that, that the original one doesn't have. It's written more efficiently and it's faster. So Bart's sitting on CRAN right now. OK. Um, so. Let's use that to fit our models. Seems like it would make sense. So I've got a paper in JCGS 2011 that basically compares, says, you know, what, what, what would I do here? Um, let's just fit this model. And the basic idea, again, I'm trying to avoid all the notation and equations. Take your data set and then make it into two data sets. There's the one data set which shows the world with all your people but let's pretend none of them got the treatment, right? So that is this one. So I just changed all the Z's to zero. The Z is your treatment indicator. Let's take your data set and pretend everyone got the treatment. So after you fit, you just make predictions as if no one got the treatment and as if everyone did, right? It's pretty simple. People have done versions of this with parametric models in the past. This is just a version with the non-parametric model. The nice thing about BART is that it's then sitting in this Bayesian framework, so you can get posterior distributions for whatever the heck you want, right? So you can get them for, I can get a posterior predictive distribution for my Y1 or my Y0, or for half the room, Y1 and Y0, or the other half, or all the men, or all the women, or whoever I want, right? And then I can average that up however I want, and I've got a natural quantification of my uncertainty. Um, and here is just a, so this goes back to that, the plot I did at the beginning, what, what would BART do here? It does pretty well. So this is the treatment effect, right? So the true treatment effect is the red line for all the treated people, okay? So just the difference between those two lines from this plot is displayed in this. And for each person, for each red dot in this diagram, I have <coughs> a posterior predictive interval of their, that person's treatment effect, right? So what we want is for those intervals to all cover the line that represents the true treatment effect. And it does pretty well until we get out here. Now I cheated a little, right? Because there's this dot. Oops. I'll show you later what happens when, when that one point isn't there to help ground my inference, all right? But it's doing, it's, it does a lot better than the regression fit, which is that dotted line, which just does terribly. So the regression fit, you know, does okay in this area, but then goes up haywire over here. And the nice thing about the regression fit is that it's really, really confident about its wrong answer. So it has like a really tiny standard error. I'm losing my voice a little because I'm shouting. Uh, I think it would be more of a hassle with the. Okay. How am I doing? Because it's hard for you to know given you don't know how many slides I have left. It's a little bit of a mystery. Mm. So I've got JCGS paper on that, one in multivariate behavioral research. I'm sure you guys read that a lot. It's on your coffee table. I actually like that paper, though. Uh, right, this one I, I compare it to, like, um, sorry, let's just say Hill et al. This one wasn't just me. Um, I compare it to, like, 25 different propensity score matching um, techniques. Okay. But what do I do about this whole... Maybe I shouldn't even be making inferences out here. How do I know when I should be, when I shouldn't be? Okay, well, the nice thing is Bart's giving me a big red flag. It's like, ah, oh, hello, pay attention to me. I don't have a lot of information here. Maybe you shouldn't be trusting me, right? It's telling you. Um, so I thought a lot about, well, how do I know when it's, when it, when it's big too big, right? It's, it's, it's hard to figure out a cutoff for that. So I decided that the, the, the comparison is the other treatment group where we have data, 
right? So I know what the uncertainty is when I have data about what the Y1 is. So that can be my guide for what uncertainty I would like to be seeing for my Y zeros, right? And when this is much bigger than this, so when these lines are much longer than these, then I get nervous, okay? Of course, there's lots of different ways of operationalizing that, too. I like this paper, but I don't love, love, love the choices. I, I kind of made some ad hoc choices that seem to work well. If anyone wants to do it better, have at it. Um, so one thing I did is I just looked at the standard deviations of all of these posterior intervals. And the, on the, the top histogram is the plot of those standard deviations for the treated, and uh, for the Y1s, rather. And then I've got a plot of those standard deviations for the Y zeros. So maybe I don't, maybe I only want to keep observations for whom the standard deviation of their Y zero distribution is close enough, right? So at some point I get out to these, and this is so much bigger than this, I don't trust it anymore, okay? The other one is to actually take a direct ratio of those. As opposed to thinking about it distributionally, for each individual, look at that. Um, and then I used a chi-squared distribution to say how big was too big. Because that's what we do with ratios of variances, right? The common statistical trope. Okay, got those rules. Here's just a stupid little pedagogical example. Um, so one of the reasons I like this, so if, if you're a person I don't mean to beat up on propensity scores. There's a lot that's good about propensity scores. I think um, introducing propensity scores brought a lot of attention to causal inference, a lot of attention to the issue of overlap, not making um, inferences, causal inferences, when you don't actually have anyone who looks like you in the other group. That's a really important thing. Lots of good stuff came out of it. There are things I don't love, which is that so much is based on the propensity score. The propensity score, um, so if you use the propensity score to decide when you have overlap or not, you're privileging the variables that predict the treatment. They may not predict the outcome. Some of them, in fact, may not be confounders at all. So you're not, you're, you're gonna end, you may end up in situations where you think you don't have overlap, and you really do, in terms of causal common support, right? Causal overlap. So here's an example like that where X1 predicts the treatment. I've got two, two covariates, but no true confounders. X1 predicts the treatment. X2 predicts the outcome. So th there's no confounders, actually, because there's nothing that predicts both. Okay? So here's my, my space, and you can tell the... Um, oh, it's hiding. Sorry. Okay. Ah! Um, the controls are the squares. The blue squares, the treated, are the circles. If they're filled in, the method would drop them. So on the left hand side, on this side, I've got what propensity score matching would do. It would get very nervous over here because it would say, I don't have any confounders. But who cares? Because there's no, I mean, it doesn't, it thinks there's no confounder, uh, counterfactuals because it's, it's worried about X1, but X1 isn't a confounder, so it doesn't matter. X1 completely determines the treatment, right? So um, all the treated, Sorry, I am not describing this slide well. All the treated are over here, whereas the controls are everywhere. The controls are the circles. Treated are over here. Propensity score matching says, uh-oh, there's no controls uh, over here. You should drop all those treated observations. There's no reason to. X1's not important. So the BART methods do differentially well. The, um, the ratio method drops a little too many. And the standard deviation method does a little bit of a better job, but does nowhere near the damage that the other ones do. Okay. I'm not going to show you the simulation evidence because simulations are boring. Um, sorry. <laughs> I always do simulations, but I decided not to. Uh, it's all in the paper, so I don't need to show you. But trust me that simulations, trust them or not, um, in this case show that, that BART beats a lot of other competitors for this task, okay? Uh, in part, that's also because little of what we saw here was that some of the machine, if you use machine learning to, techniques to fit propensity scores, 
they tend to overfit, and then you really, you, it aggravates the problem even more. Mm. General reliability, heterogeneous treatment effects. Um, you can estimate heterogeneous treatment effects. You can see you're doing a different treatment effect for each individual, right? Um, Green and Kern have a nice extension of BART that, that, that does this um, nicely. Um, and that allows you to generalize to other populations, right? So if you have different treatment effects for different kinds of people, then you can't, Pearl calls it transportability. You can't transport your treatment effect estimate from one population to another, because it might be a different makeup of people who have different kinds of characteristics changing the average treatment effect, okay? But if that variability is based on uh, observed covariates, it's easy to do, right? You, and so in the BARD framework, you just throw that new data set in, do your predictions, and off you go. So this is a paper comparing a BARD approach to a bunch of um, propensity score approaches. Um, Don Green pulled Liz Stewart and I into this because she was the propensity score person and I was the BART person. And so he figured it would be more fair and balanced if um, we had people from both sides. So BART won. <laughs> okay. Then there was a big competition that I um, ran with Vince and uh, a couple of our colleagues for, uh, alongside the 2016 Causal Inference, Atlantic Causal Inference Conference, which I organized in New York. And um, I will be talking about that at the R conference. So all I will say is that um, BART did well. Among other things, I didn't submit BART, um, but we ran, anyway, there's another, there was another competition last year, there's a new one this year, you should check it out if you're into competitions. There aren't enough of them in statistics, um, so they're kind of fun. Okay, so uh, Vince and I have been talking forever about pulling all this stuff into one package. So there is now a package that answers the question why, BART cause. I told Vince I was gonna make that joke. He's like, don't make that joke. <laughs> don't make that joke. I told my daughter, she's like, don't make that joke. <laughs> I have to make the joke. Why? Because. Um, so it's Bart Cause. Uh, we still are playing around. Is it now the camel? Okay. So we've played around with what's capitalized, what's not. Oh, so this is. It doesn't matter for the URL. Doesn't matter for the URL. Okay. Okay. So um, assuming ignorability, assuming um, all the factors measured. Okay. Um, get you some causal effect. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the code, sorry, um, because, but it's there, sitting here, if people want to, but it's standard R code, um, easy to use, um, thoughtfully done, uh, lots of options. Um, oh, you can make it doubly robust, too, so you can estimate propensity scores and then throw them in and do things like that, too. Okay, so that was all the easy part though, right? It always makes you feel a little guilty. So I, I, this is what people talk about at lots of conferences. It's like, oh, but I've got this new matching technique or I've got this new whatever, whatever. But we're all still making this assumption that we hate and that no one believes. So you go to a stats conference on causality and everyone starts with smack. Of course, we're some ignorability, boom. Like, but what if we don't? So ignorability, again, is the all-confounders measure. What if we don't believe that? We don't believe that. We know we don't believe that, right? This is why the economists get mad at us. They're kind of right, right? Like that's, so what about the hard part? Remember, the hard part is this, this, this um, assumption. What can we do? So... It goes back to the 1950s. In the 1950s, people were still debating about whether smoking caused cancer. And R.A. Fisher, famous statistician and all-around jerk, um, <laughs> was testifying, you know, like, no, we can't prove that they're related because we would need a randomized experiment and blah, 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 blah. Did he smoke? I don't know. That's a good question. I bet he did. He did? Did someone just say it? Okay. So, um, this guy named Cornfield, who is clever, said, wait a second. So, so 
you're saying that what could be happening is that we each have something in us that makes us either more or less likely to smoke, some kind of genetic thing maybe, and more or less likely to get lung cancer. What would that thing have to look like, right? So it turns out that thing <laughs> would have to be an almost perfect predictor of lung cancer, and it would have to be about nine times more prevalent in smokers than non-smokers. Yeah, th th that doesn't exist. Like, no one believes, not any, no one in the scientific community believes that that exists. Um, and that was really powerful evidence, right? So, that's what we're going to do, right? So lots of people have done this stuff, I and mean, this is not, this is not, I'm not at all referencing the millions of people who have come before. Um, how we're just extending our assumptions to say, well, right, what if there was like just that one extra confounder and we had that thing, would we believe it, right? So in education, it's always motivation. Oh, but you haven't measured motivation. <sighs> You're right. I have 200 other variables about everything that's ever happened in this child's life, but there could be a part of motivation that is distinct from all of those things that could be playing a role. You're right. I go, I'll schizophrenic on this topic, right? I go both ways. Um, okay, so we've extended some work that other people have done, and uh, it's a basic, we're not even going to talk about the data generating process because we've got four minutes left. We fit a big MCMC algorithm. Okay, I'm okay? Yes. All right. <laughs> okay, we fit a model and say, you know, here's the what if. So we've got, we're letting y depend on all our x's, using BART in this case. So the original work on this just fit linear models, right? So fit a regression of your outcome, uh, like all the omitted variable bias stuff in econ, or all those formulas, that's all this. When you fit linear models, that's all this is. There's no magic, except for that it's all magic in smoke and mirrors. Um, and then throw in an extra covariate, right? So we said, all right, let's do that, but instead of a linear model, let's use BART. And here, let's throw in, so this is our, these are our sensitivity parameters. So here I've just got like a probit model for a binary treatment, okay? Simple probit model, again, letting, um, in this case, I'm letting them be linear related. That's a longer story why we did that. Um, and then here again, allowing it to depend on the unobserved covariate. But what do you mean? You don't have that covariate. Oh, that's right. It's missing data, right? We know how to deal with missing data, I just, right? So in this case, we're being Bayesian, so we just say, let's pretend. What if we had it? This would be easy to solve, right? Then if we had all the parameters of the model, it'd be kind of easy to generate, oh, goodness gracious, um, to generate you. So you ends up just being, um, I don't know. Someone wanted to trip me, I think. Um, Ari Fisher, come back from the grave. Um, it's a binomial distribution with a, you know, complicated statement for the probabilities. Um, but it's, it's, it's actually not hard math, okay? So we can just fit that using, what, a big MCMC algorithm, playing that game. If we knew this, that would be easy. If we knew that, this would be easy. Iterate around. I say easy because Vince did the programming. <laughs> um, okay. What do we get out at the end of the day? I'm not going to talk about that. Effective medication on high blood pressure. Why was this a good example? Because there are lots of covariates that have nonlinear relationships with blood pressure. For instance, age, right? So you might not trust slapping a linear model on if you're, if you're doing this problem. Okay. So what do we get out of this? All right, it looks a little complicated. And I would say that the graphics could be prettier, but what do we get out of this? This is a contour plot, okay? So, um, and the x axes are the sensitivity parameters, right? So those are just regression coefficients. The one is the regression coefficient in the probit model relating the unobserved covariate and the observed covariates to the treatment, right? And so this is the coefficient on that hypothetical unobserved confounder in that. And this is the one for the outcome model, which is a continuous model. Right? It's like a linear regression, except for then we throw BART at that, the, the piece around the observed covariates to make it nonlinear. 
but the coefficient on u is just what you think of as a standard kind of linear regression coefficient. Uh, okay, so this number right here says what happens if there's no confounding. This is just our naive treatment effect estimate. Why? Because it corresponds to sensitivity parameter set to zero, right? What do the other ones do? Well, for instance, for this line, it's all the combinations of sensitivity parameters that would lead to a treatment effect estimate of 0.36. And we always, that we always give the option and we default to the option of putting those numbers in standardized coefficients um, so that they're all in standard deviation units with respect to the outcome. So they have some meaning. Okay, so if there's lots of confounding, it's gonna move lots of positive confounding, it's going to move your um, treatment effect estimate from 0.15 to 0.36. Okay. That's the basic game we're playing. These are the combinations of sensitivity parameters that would lead you to, that would move your estimate to zero. These um, I feel a little queasy about, move things to non-significance. Um, I hate p-values. Other people like them, it's there for now. Um, how do we know what's a lot of confounding? Well, in standard deviation units, we actually know a fair amount. Like, we can actually think pretty well about what regression coefficients, how big they might be, right? They're somewhat bounded by the amount of variance left over in the data anyway, which is the, the, the bounds that are right there on the plot anyway. We've also plotted coefficients for all the observed covariates. Right, so how big are those things? You know, those could be misleading. If you've got a complete crap model with nothing in there that's predictive, okay, you probably don't want to trust those. You have to, there's science involved here. Right? You actually have to think about what would the confounder look like? If it's motivation, how would that be affecting my outcome and my treatment, right? You have to have some sense of that. And if you're wrong, you're going to get it wrong, right? You're telling a story here. But maybe it makes you a little more, if things are not very sensitive, then maybe it makes you a little more confident in your answers, at least. Okay. And this is just to show that the, um, if you fit it linearly, if you just fit the linear model, which is what our original package did, pre-BART, um, you actually get a pretty different answer. So it, this is an example where it really may make sense. So I, I will admit, though, that we cherry-picked. We looked at, like, 16 different I know it made a difference in like three out of 16 things we looked at. So it could make a difference. It might not. Who knows? Probably not going to hurt. Might help. Okay. So that sits in the stats and med paper. This is in a different software package in TreatSense. Okay. Okay. Why Bart? I'm almost done. I promise. Beer soon. Um, is BART the key? Why BART? All right, so I told you an example before. If you look at the BART papers, it, it, it does nicely. They tested over like 42 different data sets. I think there's like this, at least 10 years ago, there was like the 42 that everyone used, and those are the ones they used, and they did really well. It's great. It's not the only game in town, right? There are other things out there. I would encourage you to investigate other options. I'm working on a project right now with Andrew Gelman where we're trying to build out Gaussian processes to do similar things. Um, they're a little more finicky, um, but there's potential there because they could also be more powerful. BART's just a nice workhorse. It just does really well in a lot of situations without having to try hard. It doesn't mean it's optimal, but I like the idea of just being able to hand out something that I think in most situations is going to do okay. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the, the world we're in. It gives you, again, the uncertainty intervals, things like that. It's easy, and it's even easier now that we have this package. Um, so, again, plugging my talk at the Causal Inference Conference. Um, we have an archive paper that you can look at uh, if you want to preview or see whether it's going to be worth it or get your, like, mean comments ready in advance. Um, there you go. Uh, okay, so conclusions. I think it's useful, right? Like, I, I part, I've got some of my students are around here, and some of them, a bunch of them have taken my causal inference class, and they all hate, I don't think I'm lying when I say they all hate the propensity score homework. 
it sucks because you know what it's hard and it's really hard to know when you're doing well and it takes a lot of time and there's no clear metrics for whether or not things are balanced well or not and it's like a great idea that kind of had its time sorry um, uh, that's that's too too hand wavy but um, I think that Creating tools that are easy to use and robust that we can hand to people and not expect them to spend hours and hours trying to match some metric that hasn't even been well defined about how you're doing well enough is just one of 10,000 ways to go insane and waste people time. And I would rather have researchers spending time on important things than trying to find balance in a propensity score match sample. Like that just seems like go watch you know, Deadwood or something, or I don't know, sorry, my favorite TV show. Um, do something else with your time, okay. Uh, so, but it's still, it's not the only game in town. I think there's lots of other cool research to be done in this area. I encourage people to do it. If you look at the competition, you see Bart did well, but a bunch of other things did well too. I was really swayed by Mark Vanderland's super learner stuff. Um, so, uh, anyway, take, check it out. Um, we need more development. There's more that needs to be done. We're talking about trying to move some of this stuff over to Python, because um, there's not a lot of good causal stuff in Python right now. Um, binary BART is a bit of a problem that we're working on. Group data structures people are working on. There's nothing freely available yet. There's, I mean, this is pretty basic, right? So there's a lot that, that could be expanded on this. Packages, dbarts for standard BART. Bart cause for most of the stuff I talked about, treat sense for the sensitivity analysis stuff. And if you want um, the 7,700 data sets that we used for the 2016 uh, data causal inference data analysis challenge, they're all sitting out there, along with the code to generate them. So the truth, the true treatment effects for all the data sets, um, it's a great testing grounds. So if you want to compare your favorite causal inference method versus something else, have at it, and then please cite us. That's all. Um, okay, thank you. This was really fun. Great time. Questions? Yeah. In the cold house, we'll try to run a mic so everybody get questions. Who has questions? Right here. Our live tweet for the night. Uh, uh, Emily is taking over tonight the NY Half Hour Twitter account. So if you like the live tweeting, we'll encourage her to do it again and again and again. Hi, thanks for your great talk. Um, before I tweet out misinformation, I just want to make sure I completely understand. So would you would it be accurate to say that BARD can basically substitute for where you might use normally a propensity score for causal inference? And is that at all a, a limitation of other applications that you do to say it's sort of like a, a new way to do better, better way to do what propensity score tries to do for causal inference? Um, so I get to so the first question. First question would be, yeah, I think so. With the caveat that you would want to make sure you have overlap, and there are tools for that, um, just as you would in propensity score matching. It may be less obvious when you when you go this way. Um, is it was the second question? Is that the only thing it can do? Yeah. I mean, Bart has been used in all kinds of applications and all kinds of sciences no. all over the place. So this is like, I stole this thing that's been used in this in like. Hold it up and said, hey, but it, if it works really well in all those other things, let's use it here too. Yeah. Another question? Um, how would you adapt it to more than two precincts? Hmm. So, Jared Murray, oh, more than two treatments, more than two treatments. Oh, it's easy, actually. So that's easy. Changing the any predictor is not hard. So you just throw in your, I would put in, put it in as two indicator variables, right? And then you can just do any kinds, you could make, in, when I had that slide where I had the two data sets, right, then you just have three. So you've got three potential outcomes now. What would have happened here? What would have happened here? What would have happened here? And then you can do whatever comparisons you want. You can also do, and in the JCDS paper, I do a continuous treatment effect too. That makes it harder because you don't want to think about all the comparisons, and that one I just do, um, the comparison of all the potential outcomes on different dosages if you get the treatment versus nothing. So that's one way. But there are, I should say, though, that there's also, Jared Murray has done some fantastic work extending BART to 
different kinds of outcomes. Um, so multinomial outcomes and things like that. Thank you, Joel. Um, the question I had was uh, in comparing BART to say all the machine learning models which are much more highly uh, nonlinear. Yeah. So, you know, the buzzword everybody. Deep learning. So <laughs> very deep networks achieve very, very large nonlinearities. So I'm wondering you know, if you sort of looked at the impact of very highly potentially nonlinear models compared to, I don't know, yeah so I think in in, um, in social science we just uh, so the nonlinearity this captures a whole lot the interactions it's not going to get you much past second or third if they're there and really strong it will find them but it's it's pulling against that I mean, you could change, if you know they're there, you could change a prior to not pull against that so much. But it's not going to do the same kind of thing that like a neural net would do. So when I first started working with Uri Shalit, who helped us run the contest, who's a machine learning guy, he fit neural nets to the, um, the same data using JCGS. And in the beginning, they were having a hard time getting them to work well, even with a lot of tweaking. And finally, they said, well, they're just too simple. It's <laughs> just this problem's too simple. It wants a hard problem. He, he's since overcome that, and he says that they're working great now. But it took some doing. Um, and actually, Uri um, has some other work using neural nets for causal inference that I would encourage you to look at. He does, he's fantastic. Um, so I think it's possible. I think in social science, which is my world, it just doesn't. You know, and, and the, the, the signal relative to noise is, you know, everything gets swamped. So I, I feel like it's almost overkill to even do this much, frankly. Last question. Have you compared it to Ashibu's Kikuli? I have not. A really cool thing. You, beat Ashibu. you know what? I hear that there's a corpus of 7,700 data sets <laughs> sitting on a GitHub repository that just prime for Challenge is out there. Everybody's through. <laughs> <laughs> You're to any other method you want. There you go. Yeah. I appreciate your, your talk showing the, like, the support of the control group and treatment group are overlapping or the way you can do a multivariate analysis, make that assessment that they are overlapping. Yeah. Um, in the social sciences, there's a reminder of autophagy composition that sort of addresses that some of the covariates of independent variables are different across groups and tries to get at Yeah, it definitely addresses that. Um, yeah, I haven't seen, why aren't people using Oaxaca in this setting? I don't know. I mean, if you use it just ba you know, to predict, to think about the differences across treatment groups of the covariates and don't think about the outcome, you'll run into the same problem that all the propensity score things do in that they're, you're going to privilege the wrong covariates. Um, but if you can take into account information on the outcome variable, it could be useful. But yes, this is, that's getting at that, basically. But it's targeting, in some sense, the sufficient statistic, which is really the potential outcomes. Right? So it's saying, what we actually care about is imbalance in that thing. And these covariates are just proxies for that. So we only care about the covariates to the extent that they are predictive of that. So it targets it more, I guess I would say. Any other questions? I don't think so. Okay. All right, I guess there's any more.